guys hear me at the back? Okay, great. Um, thanks so much uh, for the introduction. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm normally a pretty happy, exuberant person, but it's like especially sweet after so many years of the pandemic to see old friends and meet new colleagues and have these great discussions together. So just, uh, I hope you're you know, living, living your moment here in Toronto and taking advantage of uh, being out in, in the wild again. And it's just so lovely to be together. And thanks, Michael, uh, for your kind words. I, I feel the same way about you. <laughs> <laughs> In that, I can't believe it's been 10 years. Um, so before, before we start this off, I just wanted to acknowledge that a lot of what I'm presenting today is the work of a, of a you know, large number of, of students, uh, postdocs, and some research associates and staff, uh, lots of collaborators and partners, and thanks to my funders as well. And as you're reading this list, like um, my students the other day, when they found out I was giving this keynote, they were just like really happy for me, but curious, like, how'd you do it, Steve? How'd you get this invitation? And I said, you know, it starts now while your grad students work hard, you know, write good papers, make an impact, meet good people, keep hustling, and one day you'll be invited to join an organizing committee of an international conference uh, during a global pandemic. And, and after the committee invites a few esteemed international speakers to travel during a pandemic and they all say no, one day it can happen to you. <laughs> um, but I'm obviously absolutely thrilled to, to have been asked to, to give this talk and I hope um, you find it interesting today. Uh, I really like to begin with a hypothetical question around, you know, what transportation research or what transportation planners should be focusing on. And, you know, even in a, in a fairly specialized conference like Nectar, we have uh, experts in the room who focus on all of these different aspects of the transportation system. And, you know, should there, and I, I hope you all can see the, the text, but it's a bit small. The other text will be bigger. Uh, bigger font size, but you know, focusing on efficiencies, focusing on freight, on economic development, on urban, urban, in, you know, uh, land use interactions. Uh, in, in the last ten years, you know, a lot of attention given to big data and trying to use big data to have smarter, more intelligent transportation systems with automated and connected vehicles. And all the while, while we're researching these interesting topics and planning for these interesting topics. We're trying to mitigate some of the externalities. We're trying to mitigate uh, pollution effects and health effects and, uh, and of course the looming kind of climate crisis and the contribution of transportation there as well. And in, in all of the, this uh, mix, it really just makes me think about um, people and how little, uh, maybe not in this room, but how little transportation planning and research traditionally and even today focuses on on people. And I want to remind everyone all the time that one of the main purposes, not the only, but one of the main reasons for the transportation system is that we are trying to enable people to participate in their daily life activities. And, you know, it just uh, is a fact that this core objective, like something that is so fundamental to the raison d'etre right? This is a bilingual country, you know. Uh, <laughs> raison d'etre uh, for uh, the transportation system is, is largely not um, focused on in, in a really direct way. And I'm not the first person to make that observation, of course, but I want to remind you there. And, and when I look around and I ask and I see what's happening in research and I see what's happening in practice, I really question um, whether or not we know how to focus on people and enabling this goal of um, allowing uh, a diverse population to participate, giving them the opportunity to participate in just the normal activities of daily life. And especially uh, important in today's world and probably always is, you know, do we know how to provide that benefit equally and fairly uh, across the population? Can we do that in a just way or in an equitable way? 
And I'm not going to do a lot of uh, discussion on, on theory, but you know, I, I just turn to a very basic definition of, of transportation equity uh, when I'm thinking about what it's all about or trying to explain it to people. And it boils down to trying to understand the fairness in the distribution of the costs and benefits of the transportation system. And that's a really simple definition, but it actually gives rise to many, many um, fascinating research questions. Uh, and I look around the room and I know that there's you know, dissertations and theses and big research grants focused on some questions that come right out of this definition, like you know, what are the costs of the transportation system and how do we measure them? What are the benefits and how do we measure those? Um, if we're talking about the distribution of those costs and benefits, who are the people that we're distributing those, you know, those um, uh, benefits across and between? So, you know, who are the, what are the population groups? And even after we've defined all of this, a core question remains: is like, what is a fair distribution of those of those benefits? And so you can see why it's just a fascinating research area because it kind of transcends from the very technical uh, of you know the most detailed and sophisticated accessibility metrics and using network data and transit data and cycling data and congestion and real time, and, you know, all of these technical topics, all the way to the very philosophical topics of um, what is fair. That's no small question. But fortunately, um, there's been some other great contributors out there, not me, who have kind of done a lot of the hard work of trying to translate um, these like theoretical, political theory questions of justice and fairness into the transportation domain. And I know a lot of you have worked on this and a lot of other people who I'm not gonna mention today have worked on this, but um, the, just, you know, the core, um, some people have been really influential, say in my line, line of work, um, one of them is Carl Martins, who unfortunately um, emailed us uh, uh, about a week ago to say that he couldn't make it here after all. But you know, Carl, Carl did a, a really great job of digesting some of the core principles of justice. And one of the things that, you know, Carl's big contribution is making us think about the importance of um, sufficientarianism. So um, how much transportation benefit is enough and, and what should be, what is the bare minimum that should be supplied to every individual in, in, a, in a city or country or all residents, all people. So some kind of minimum standard. Um, of course, that's not the only way to think about equity and, and justice. And if you want a more kind of thorough review of, of those different topics, and uh, Rafa over here in the front row has done just a, a, a tremendous job, I think, of making a really, difficult for, for geographers and engineers and planners, really difficult political theory concepts, kind of understandable and categorized and relatable and applicable to transportation. So if you're looking for um, kind of another kind of overview of different political theories, like I think Rafa's work is, is fantastic and there's been others that have picked up and extended and, and so on since then. Um, but I would be um, remiss to not mention the contributions also of Karen Lucas, who comes at this from a slightly different perspective, not necessarily justice uh, based in the same way or distributed, like distributive justice in the same way, but um, more of a, a capabilities approach and trying to understand how we can alleviate people's barriers to participation. And that gets wrapped up into um, this really, um, unbelievable uh, framework, uh, the, the transport and social exclusion framework, which um, really motivates a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the work that you all do as well. Thinking about how um, social and economic marginalization or disadvantages um, combines with, uh, uh, dis, you know, disconnects between people's needs and what's provided to them by society in the transportation system, which we might call um, a transportation disadvantage, and how 
how the combination of, of, of social and economic disadvantages with transport disadvantages um, leads to transport poverty and the, uh, the an increased amount of difficulty people are faced with when trying to go out and reach meaningful activity destinations. And of course, over the long run, if things are more, more difficult to, to do, people tend to do less of them. And that's when people might find themselves being, you know, um, excluded, or socially excluded. But it's not the only way to think about it. You can also think about how that would have a negative impact on well-being or quality of life or health outcomes or upward mobility. So social exclusion is one potential outcome of transport poverty, but I think it relates to so many different types of outcomes as well, and that's what makes it also really um, useful as a framework. And it's a bit it's a bit cynical, but when I look back at my, the last 15 years of my research, um, sometimes I think what I do is I'm I'm studying all the arrows on this chart. <laughs> it seems I mean I hate to put it that way because there's obviously more to it, but you know really a lot of us actually are thinking about these different arrows here and have been making contributions and in my estimation my evaluation of the research not just what I've done but what I see time and time again is just how much this framework holds up empirically it's really almost never refuted like these basics of how under how underserved communities who are also you know marginalized socially or economically um, how their experiences in the transportation system end up creating extra barriers, extra cons constraints, or forced, you know, excessive traveling, and you know, all of those outcomes, we find it time and time again. Um, so these aren't the only precedents, and of course, people have been doing transport equity research and practice long before. Um, some of these great contributions in the last 10 years or 15 years around like thinking about it from a political theory perspective and you know a basic one is what we see uh, happening or what we have seen happen in, in the United States uh, since the 1960s and the passing of the Civil Rights Act they they you know they're a country that's had probably the longest standing um, anti-discrimination laws and regulations in the in, in transportation planning anywhere in the world and of course you know those um, historically have been all about um, making sure that the um, uh, infrastructure and services that are being provided um, are not done in a, a discriminatory way or that different uh, population groups aren't kind of uh, impacted uh, negatively when infrastructure is, is planned and built and delivered. Um, but I think I'm seeing a turn now uh, in practice and in the research, uh, moving away from anti-discrimination and really thinking more about redressing, <clears throat> meaning like trying to acknowledge the past harms done to marginalized communities and thinking about how transportation investments can be used to actually uh, uh, give justice, right? Or I don't like the idea of giving justice, but um, you know, of of trying to make right past harms and trying to re-equalize the playing field uh, because of uh, you know and, and, uh, uh, discrimination that and harms done in the past and actually continue to be done here. Uh, the other kind of more basic way that we've all been thinking about transportation equity is through this um, image and thinking about the difference between equality on the left where uh, we assume that everyone can make use of government um, you know, uh, uh, transfers in the same way, right? And that everyone can use the same benefit and uh, overcome their challenges, right? Versus more of a equity perspective where we recognize that different people have different needs and that we need to provide um, uh, 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 services such that, you know, to, more to some people in order for them to overcome those barriers. 
And there's also kind of an additional, this diagram has been extended a few times. I don't know if, you, is anyone showing? That was Ada, right? So is anyone showing it? So uh, I don't want to steal the thunder of, of the panelists, but you know, you can imagine another box here where the fence has been removed altogether. So how do we, not, it's not just about distributing transportation equitably, but it's also about how do we eliminate those systemic barriers that are actually stopping people from watching the sports game in the first place. And I know um, some of these concepts may be really difficult for, um, for us, and especially the European visitors, um, but I just want to encourage you to, like, imagine it's not a baseball game and it's a soccer match. And yeah, so now it should become uh, clearer for you. Okay, so um, <laughs> joke number two, okay? I've got, like, maybe two more. So, um, you know, and trying to uh, rationalize the work in this space, I'm often asked, like, why is this so important right now? Is this, does this matter in Canada, in a country like Canada, in the face of you know, 700 million people living in extreme poverty around the world? Uh, Two billion people don't have access to safely managed drinking water around the world. Uh, there's horrific wars happening in the world. There's systemic oppression of uh, all sorts of uh, marginalized groups different, uh, of different forms all over the world. We're on the brink of a climate disaster. Uh, the hegemony of the United States is falling apart and it's the end of democracy. Uh, like, you know, why, why this, why now in a country like, like Canada? And I was talking to my mom <laughs> and, you know, and my mom said, like, Dr. Farber, even First world problems need solutions. And there's a bit, I mean, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but there's a bit of wisdom in that. And before I continue, how many professors in the room make their mother call them doctor? <laughs> <laughs> Only me? Okay. I'll, That's three. I'll save that for another time uh, or over a drink tonight. Okay, so, um, no, but in all seriousness, um, can Canada and many countries around the world are. I think experiencing several trends, urban, economic, and, and social trends, uh, spatial trends that are uh, bringing to the point, you know, in a serious way, the importance of thinking about equity in the transportation system. The first is just a basic growth in inequality that's been occurring, um, you know, due to liberal liberalization of uh, Western economies uh, over the past 50 years. And in Canada in particular, you know, income inequality is in the rise uh, overall, on the rise overall across the country, but also in every city in Canada, if we just zoom in on each city, um, the Gini index you know, is, is, a, is on the rise as well. The second, uh, and you may have heard about this already after speaking to some Torontonians here, is that we're suffering through a major affordability crisis right now. So the plot on the left is for Vancouver. It shows the the uh, the kind of median price of a of a average house in Vancouver in red versus what would be considered an affordable house price given income levels in that same city, where a household is spending 25% of their income on uh, say mortgage payments, right? Uh, so in Vancouver. Houses are about twice as expensive as what we would call affordable, and Toronto's um, just a bit behind that ratio, but has seen an even steeper uh, growth trend in that ratio over the last few years. And the final um, kind of socio-spatial trend that we all need to be aware of is this uh, trend of the suburbanization of poverty. and. Um, I think this is a bit more of a North American issue than maybe a European issue. But if you look on the map, uh, uh, if you look at the map on the left, which is the city of Toronto in the 1960s, we see that poverty in red is concentrated in the, in the core of the city uh, with kind of wealthier neighborhoods dispersed mostly around the suburbs, the car dependent suburbs. And if we flash forward to 2020, we see almost a reversal of that trend with wealth concentrated more in the core of the city, especially up and down kind of the Young Subway and a few other historical wealthy neighborhoods, 
but that the proliferation of, um, uh, of people living in poverty is actually occurring out in these car dependent suburbs. And we were very cognizant of these trends and, and we actually thought, so, you know, could we do some accounting of this? Like, uh, and, we, and we tried to conduct a national accounting of how many people, uh, especially how many people living in low income households in this country are also living in places with extremely low levels of uh, accessibility, here measured as access to destinations via, via transit. And I meant to remove the first column. Never, like we have like an extreme accessibility threshold and a not as extreme on the right, but if we take that not extreme threshold for accessibility, we find that um, you know, 1.3 million people in 2016, low income people, uh, people living, not just low income, people living below the poverty line, were also living in um, extremely uh, accessibility deprived neighborhoods as well. And the numbers have certainly uh, been increasing over the last five years, since the last census. And with the pandemic and everything, we're very excited to see the results of the census when they come in. Uh, if you zoom in on a city like Toronto, and I should acknowledge that a lot of these figures are made by uh, Jeff Allen. Uh, uh, I'm not, the, he, he's done tremendous visualization work for, for me in the lab over the last five years. Um, but uh, if you look at the city of Toronto in, you know, the colors here are, are showing you the accessibility levels, access to destinations via transit. And each little black dot, and I hope you can see them at the back, I'm not sure, but each little black dot here represents 50 people living below the poverty line. And when we do the accounting, we see about half of the people living with poverty in Toronto are in these purple areas, the two kind of higher accessibility uh, quant uh, quantiles here, right? And the other half are living well outside in places where it's much more difficult to reach uh, important destinations via the transit network. It's about half-half. But so think about the experience of people living with poverty uh, and compare the experience of the people in, in those uh, densely served areas compared to those living on, it, it, you know, on, the, on the periphery. And think about the transportation and social exclusion framework. And I think we can all predict that um, you know, using these theories that the folks, the folks in living with poverty who also don't have great access to amenities, maybe they're not actually participating as much as those living in the urban core under certain, similar kind of economic uh, means, but not necessarily transportation provision means. And when we look at the impact that has at a very kind of course level, we actually see that in the suburbs where low incomes are intersecting with um, accessibility deprivation, we, we, these participation deserts emerge. So concentrations uh, of, of households and people who are participating in low numbers of daily activities. And we can measure that using our, uh, our survey data you know, our travel survey data, which we collect every five years, but there's new approaches now using big data and things like that and trying to apply it to this question as well. And I also want to show you that, yes, like we have half of the low income population kind of living here in our downtown, but relatively speaking, we see some activity suppression based on income, of course, but, um, not nearly as prevalent an issue in terms of um, staying at home and not participating in those daily activities. And we can chart this and model this and we can see that as, um, so these are the low income groups and one color is for carless households and one color is for households with, sorry, these are the carless household groups. And, you know, neighborhoods with very low transit accessibility we see a huge gap between um, households with cars and households without cars. So if the average um, participation level per day is 1.25 activities across the entire population, 
those living in kind of poorly served areas and living without cars are doing less than 0.5 activities per day, right on the fringe, right? But the, the better served and the more and more service uh, people have in terms of access to destinations, that gap between you know, rich and poor and the gap between especially car owners and not car owners really disappears. And in the higher served parts of the city, there's no statistical difference anymore necessarily, right? Uh, between the different uh, groups. So I really see accessibility as a way to equalize the, uh, some outcomes in the population, important outcomes like activity participation. Maybe the fundamental purpose for the transportation system, and this is what we should be focusing on. And of course we've modeled it and we have all sorts of nice uh, big data sets and doing um, stratified regression models by income and, and automobile ownership. And you know what we find is that this accessibility effect on participation is certainly strongest amongst uh, households with low or no car ownership. Okay? But that the effect is also most pronounced in lower income households compared to wealthier households. Where even if you don't have a car in a wealthier household, you, know, you don't necessarily need extra transit accessibility to fulfill your daily needs. You can pay for taxis, you've got Uber, you've got, you may be living in a, a higher amenity area where that you can walk to, you know, walk to places, rely on your social capital, you know, have your children pick you up if you're an elderly carless person, things like that. Um, one of the things that we did in this study is we discovered that the most significant shape of this relationship between accessibility and participation levels is this sigmoid shape, so the purple sigmoid. I think previously um, it was quite well known that we would have diminishing returns to accessibility. So as access increases over here at the high end of the access scale, you don't think giving more and more access to people who have accessibility already uh, that, that that's going to have a very pronounced impact on participation rates. Those people, you know, it's no, over here, people with, you know, accessibility is not the barrier to participating more. So adding more access doesn't unlock more participation. Um, so we, I think that's been known and theorized for a long time. What we weren't sure about is what the shape of the curve was on the low end. And it would be great if we saw that the shape was more of this red line, like a, a log, uh, yeah, a log, you know, a log, uh, a logarithmic function where kind of a increases in access at the low end actually results in a spike in participation before leveling off. But really, what we find in our data, and it's been found again uh, a couple of times in the literature since we published this, was that um, there's kind of a low return in accessibility out here on the fringe as well. So if we make investments in the most inaccessible places, we also find low returns in, in participation rates. And I mean, the main idea there is that, um, especially in, in Toronto, like just car ownership rates are really high there, even for very low income families or, or families living in poverty. And, you know, adding a bit of transit doesn't do a whole lot in um, reshaping people's ability to participate in the in the vast, you know, wide array of, of, of activities. So the most return, right, when we're thinking about unlocking suppressed demand for participation is actually somewhere in, in this middle. And of course, that's going to vary a lot by geography and person type and destination type and trip purpose and, you know, all of that. But it's somewhere in the middle. We, this is just a very high level, all activities, you know, participation rates across all activities and accessibility to all destinations. And if you look at the map of Toronto, and sorry, there's a bit of a cognitive burden because it's a different projection and scale as my previous maps, but you know, the city of Toronto previously that I showed you is this area in here, right? And if you look at, if we just simulate, what would happen if we added access of, you know, 100,000 jobs, you know, using our access measure, 100,000 jobs to every area, if we added, you know, augmented the accessibility score, 
we see like huge returns in participation actually in those inner suburbs. Why? It's where a lot of low, uh, lower income people with suppressed activity rates are living. It's where people can actually live without a car today because there's moderate levels of transit service there, but not total deprivation. But adding more transit there actually it induces more demand or more uh, participation. And I apologize, I think some of you have seen some of these results. I, I, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that I shared the preliminary results from the study three years pre-pandemic at the Helsinki conference. Um, and I only kind of put it together that hmm, probably need to update some of my motivation slides for, for MJ. But, um, but you know, the work's been finalized since then and I'm happy to, not everyone was there of course. So um, the next thing that I, I wanted to do, after enjoying a refreshment, is um, uh, introduce you all to how this work that we were doing on on participation and equity and using you know planning transportation in order to foster higher levels of social inclusion you know how that um, work um, gave rise to this really big um, national research partnership called mobilizing justice um, and you know the raise raison d'etre for mobilizing justice is really conduct research in support of uh, you know more equitable transportation planning practices and transportation outcomes for low-income and marginalized communities in Canada so mobilizing justice is a five-year research partnership this is one of our it's all been done unfortunately mostly launched during during the pandemic um, so it's a treat for many of us on the project to actually be face to face with each other to, uh, at this conference. But you know what MJ and some of you MJ might mean Michael Jordan or Michael Jackson or something else, but for us MJ means mobilizing justice. And MJ kind of coordinates and focuses Canada's transportation research and practitioner community on the accessibility, participation challenges, and lived experiences of structurally marginalized people. And it is co-developed with a multi-sectoral perspective, so across academic, government, non-for-profit, and industrial sectors. Um, we span multiple provinces and, you know, in all levels, of, you know, multiple sectors. Um, and we really try to leverage that intersectoral design to ensure certain things. We try to make sure that the research that we're conducting um, reflects the challenges and needs of practitioners and communities out there in Canada. So the ideas are really, uh, you know, the, the way that we decided what we would research was really, really came about from an intensely collaborative, um, series of, of, of workshops, and there were many of them, um, to really try to iron out uh, and incorporate the ideas of uh, from people with all different types of experience, not just academic knowledge and expertise, but expertise from practice and expertise from lived experience or working with people who are living uh, with transport problems. So we hope that through that structure, where the outcomes are really relevant, uh, and that it also creates like a pathway. So first of all, that the outcomes are relevant, so that what we do is likely to be needed at the end and applied in practice at the end. But also because we're doing this in a partnered way, um, it greases the wheels, right? It makes it easier also for adoption to occur. So we take care of both the is this relevant and needed but also because we're doing it together as a group, uh, the pumps are primed and people are ready to actually try out what we're doing and put it into practice uh, uh, relatively quickly. And of course, for many marginalized communities, academic projects like this don't operate at the pace that's necessary, but we have constraints there, of course. Just to give you picture of it, I'll skip it, but it's a large number of partners. We're about 30 different um, external 
partners across the country, and similarly, a big team of researchers dispersed across the country as well. And just to give you a sense, it's a bit of an, uh, a governance and organizational jigsaw puzzle in order to uh, co uh, coordinate and, and, and put all of this work together. But we have um, Matt Palm, who you heard at the, uh, made a few opening remarks last night. He's our research coordinator. So uh, Matt and I, uh, and along with all of the collaborators and co-leads, have really spent a lot of time trying to figure out how inputs from different projects uh, or outputs from different projects become inputs you know, somewhere else and, and so on. And so the work itself and is kind of structured around six different working groups. And thinking about our commitment to partner, you know, this being relevant to partners, every working group is co-chaired by an academic lead and a partner co-lead, all right? So all of our meetings, we have quarterly meetings, we have meetings of all different types, but we are making sure that we're hearing from a diverse, you know, a group of people different, with different experiences and purposes uh, along the way, and that keeps the research relevant over time. The other thing I really want to um, talk to you about is on the top right corner, we've created a community uh, and equity advisory table, which we call the seat. Uh, and, and that table uh, uh, consists of 20 paid members of the community from across the country. And these are people with either lived experiences of, of transport poverty or working in community organizations, advocacy groups, service providers like food banks and medical clinics, you know, who are very close to, uh, un, uh, much closer than say we are as academics and, and government partners are in understanding the needs and perspectives and, uh, of, of uh, different community members you know, uh, across the country. So this is a group that meets uh, every two months for the duration of the five-year project. And they really are an advisory panel. They review and revise our research plans, our outputs. They help us understand what kind of issues we might have when we're actually trying to go out and do work with different community groups across the country. Uh, and um, uh, we're just, amazingly like excited and enthused to see what kind how that kind of collaboration and, and, and governance structure and advice you know board is going to modify and make us rethink uh, what we think is important and what needs to happen as researchers and we all need to enter this project with a quite a lot of humility I mean I'm personally um, a person who's kind of never lived very close to um, uh, poverty, uh, you know, except as like a student, but that, anyways, but, uh, you know, you know, not, not, um, uh, not a person with a lot of uh, lived experience, right? And yet here trying to um, design and coordinate a national project all aimed at supporting the, the needs of these people. And so this is really a, a very earnest and honest attempt to provide this resource for, for the project and um, it's having an impact and, and it is changing the way that we're doing things and that's gonna be you know, something I hope to be able to present back on. It's a really important part of this project uh, in the future. So what's this project all about? We have kind of these three main objectives, documenting, uh, developing standards, and evaluating pilots. So I'll, let me go through these um, quickly. So, Document, describe, and assess the causes, scale, effects of, and responses to transport poverty in Canada. So we're one year into this project, but we've already created some resources that I think help us address this objective. So the first is we've done a, uh, I think a pretty incredible job of cataloging all of the community-based efforts out there in Canada that are somehow working in this space of combating transport poverty. And uh, I think the number of organizations and efforts that we've seen in a country of 40 million people, we've, we found about 200, um, 200 projects so far or community-led initiatives so far. And just 
you know, we have a report that describes it, but just um, for researchers on the project, it was so important to actually use these community-led initiatives to help us understand what were the actual needs uh, and challenges that people were, were facing. Is it really that they don't have a great gravity score right, in an accessibility model, or is it something else? And of course, it's everything. But you know, we've identified gaps in the transportation system, not through analysis of the transportation data, but through an analysis and an assessment of how community is responding to these gaps and trying to overcome them. And we find gaps in our system pertaining you know, across all population groups for gender and women and recent immigrants and people with disabilities, seniors and youth, uh, you know, racial minorities, uh, LGBTQ2 plus uh, persons, uh, and, and more. So for every you know, type of difference that we have uh, in, in society, we're seeing that they are somehow trying to overcome a constraint or a barrier, right, that's imposed on them by the transportation system that we've been planning. And this is also across all modes, uh, driving, taxis, ride hailing, transit, cycling, micro mobility, you know, accessible in terms of like, accessible for people with disabilities <laughs> issues, you know, just the whole variety. So there's a tremendous number of gaps. We can see them in the accessibility, right, measures, but we also can observe them by focusing on community first and trying to support what support those needs as one of our main agendas. Um, on the academic side, we, we also conducted a, and I apologize, I didn't put the first author's names on all of these initiatives, but these are not my initiatives. Um, but you know, they're MJ initiatives. And we created this living database of academic studies that also try to investigate equity issues within the transportation sector. And similarly, we find about 200 articles just on Canada alone, right? Because a lot of practitioners, uh, it's different, say, in the last few years since the pandemic and since George Floyd and BLM. And, you know, there's been a lot of growth and awareness around equity uh, across all parts of society in the last few years. But prior to that, very common to hear, this isn't a Canadian problem, it's an American problem, or it's a Global South problem. But we have 200 research articles just for Canada alone you know, showing it. And we're trying to make these resources, the community resources, the academic resources, available in courses. Uh, we're not just doing it in geography. We're trying to get this information out to engineers uh, who also do a lot of the transportation planning, of course, in this country. And don't most haven't had an education in any of these types of issues. So it's really important that we also start there with this. Going forward, the probably the, the biggest initiative that we have for documentation is um, this, whoops, this National Survey of tra Transport Poverty. So we are uh, using the funds you know, from this big, big partnership, and a lot of that money is going into collecting a, for the first time, kind of an intensive transportation survey. It's not a trip diary, right? It's, it's um, everything that we need to know about people's transportation situation, their barriers, their constraints, their desires and aspirations, right? And impacts on well-being and, and uh, participation rates and so on that we don't get from traditional travel surveys. So we really wanted to focus on um, getting new types of data and see how we can use that to um, uh, support planning practice that maybe focuses on these access on these participation outcomes and social inclusion outcomes. Um, we're also partnering with our statistical agency, Statistics Canada, and our infrastructure uh, ministry at the federal level to generate national national data sets of transport accessibility by different modes of transportation. So not many countries, I think, make their own access, you know, transport accessibility indices, but we're partnering with them and we're going to be, um, they're kind of doing a lot of the work with our advice, but then we're creating a portal into that data all with an equity lens associated with it. 
Uh, and finally, um, we've got one of the wonderful things about creating this big partnership is that we can see all of these disparate data resources across the country. Who has access to, you know, housing data? And who has access to employment data? And, and really using our network now to bring it together to do things, at least in Canada, that weren't possible before. So no one's really looked at the, uh, well, Bo is here, maybe Bo's paper on, uh, on, on transportation investments and gentrification. Um, it's, it's, it's really an understudied issue in the Canadian context, and largely because we've had big data deficiencies and not able to bring the right data together. So we are doing a national accounting of uh, uh, the, the, the residential migration of people with, in poverty moving in and out of transit served neighborhoods, especially in relation to new transit investments. Okay, the second main objective is to develop validated transportation equity standards and improved planning processes for more equitable transportation um, planning practices. And this is also kind of a complicated uh, work package, but one way to think about it is we're conducting a lot, of, a lot more research that tries to investigate the relationships between kind of social and economic outcomes amongst marginalized groups uh, with transportation supply or accessibility, you know, however you want to, to well, across many different dimensions, say. But, in a general way, you know, we've got, we've already shown that accessibility really ma matters in uh, enabling people to participate in daily activities, right? But we're going to expand on this research to look at, um, you know, those relationships for different population groups and different types of important activities relevant to, say, um, combating uh, marginalization, say, in the workforce. So. For example, focusing on something like employment equity, right, or health equity. And we have, you know, we're doing all of this research, we're using our survey uh, data, we're using administrative data from Statistics Canada, we're using our accessibility measures, and trying to explore all of these relationships, right, as basic research. But then the question is, how do we use all of these relationships to help make recommendations for what level of, of supply is actually needed to achieve certain outcomes? That's a big question that we heard from practitioners, especially, is they really, you know, they didn't know how much equity is enough, you know, how much provision is really enough to actually improve people's lives, and how do they communicate to decision makers the benefits of improving people's lives with accessibility and transport investments? And, you know, <clears throat> Coming up with statements like, if we can offer this level of accessibility, we would expect to see a reduction in missed healthcare appointments of this much, or better job matching outcomes for low income workers, or, you know, we really want to make those outcomes tangible for decision makers. And, you know, given all this work, we might, we're not sure how we'll do this yet, but we might move forward and say, hey, let's put this standard here. Where, what is the recommended level? And of course, this is going to be a political decision where to place this level, but right now they're making that decision in a vacuum of information, right? They, they don't know the difference between the impacts of providing 200,000 jobs access versus 400,000, you know? And I'm being simplistic, we're not only looking at access to jobs, but you know, uh, we want to create this um, rich, understanding of, of, of these relationships so that we can actually Im inform those debates that community members and advocates can lobby effectively, right, for uh, transportation investments in their communities that are likely to really improve their lives and so on, in the language of decision makers, right, which often in transportation, most people are still making decisions based on like kind of cost benefits and utilitarian rationales here. So trying to, we can work on that, you know, how's, how are the decisions being made, but we can also work on making this data more relevant given the current practices. And of course, we're also um, kind of 
incorporating a lot of this knowledge into business case appraisals of transportation policies and investments. So if we start with our relationships between access and outcomes, and we take a new subway investment and ask, you know, uh, if we can measure or predict the access levels associated with the new subway investment, we can combine our information about the impacts of access with the projected impacts of access, and you know, uh, use all of that in order to uh, conduct more socially relevant business cases. So try to understand the value of this of the social return on our transportation investments. And we see um, Mobilizing Justice has collaborated with Metrolinks in our region to start incorporating this kind of analysis in their business cases going forward. So again, that wouldn't have happened without the partnership, right? And we're hoping to now leverage that example to share these tools that we've developed and instructional materials that we've developed with, uh, with transportation agencies across the country to help them also um, incorporate an equity lens, a, you know, uh, a more rigorous equity lens into their uh, uh, business case assessments. Uh, there's a whole soft side to planning practices as well, of course. Uh, we're conducting research to uh, understand the professional barriers that practitioners and decision makers have in trying to support more equitable outcomes in the planning practice. So how are the um, incentives, the professional incentives within the planning workforce aligned with things like taking it slow and having you know, in-depth community engagement and planning processes and having rich and meaningful and accountable and reciprocal relationships with community, are there incentives in place to do that properly? Or are the incentives in place to you know, develop quickly, get the project off the ground, do the bare minimum to, to, tick, the, you know, to tick those boxes and so on? And how, do the, how can we think about those incentives to, um, to foster a practice that actually can is ready to incorporate a slower and more and uh, um, more robust kind of engagement with community needs in the planning practice. All right, second last slide. So, uh, <laughs> so the last objective is the evaluation of pilots. So, this was coming about. This project was coming out pre-pandemic. I would say during this time of rapid proliferation of new transportation technologies, we're all aware of the Ubers and the micro-mobility and the mass and the, you know, and, and all of that. And, and the observation we, we made and what we heard from our partners is that all of that is being pushed into cities uh, without any clear agenda to solve problems of, of inequality. And really, the, it was a very tech-forward, kind of uh, innovation-based uh, uh, process at play that pushed a lot of technology, and then only afterwards were we analyzing where possible, if we could get data and so on, if there were equity implications, right, of, of, of these new technologies. So we really want to um, leverage our partnership with tech companies, municipalities, researchers, communities, to rethink that um, approach and start with the, the, Carl loves to say, like, start with the problem. What problem are we trying to solve? And if we're trying to solve a, a social justice problem, a participation problem, well, let's now think about how we can actually use all of these great new innovative technologies uh, to solve some of these problems that we are finding in our transportation system. So we're conducting about eight field experiments across the country. Uh, to test all sorts of pilots where we're really trying to understand how new policies and technologies can uh, address the needs of different kind of uh, problems identified by, uh, you know, for different communities, it, uh, marginalized communities across the country. Um, 
So we've been workshopping a lot to, in order to develop these projects. We don't have all of those projects in place. We have funding for them, actually, uh, especially to do the evaluation of the pilots. But we don't necessarily, at the beginning of our five-year project, have all of the pieces together. But we're really fortunate that we have the funding. And our job was to create kind of an environment that could allow these important and uh, feasible pilots to, to percolate up so that we can fund them. So we've got, this is just an example of all of the great work being done by, um, a lot of it being led by Matt actually, in trying to hear from our partners. They filled out surveys about what kind of pilots they'd like to see. And we kind of took that data and made it a bit more accessible and created a Miro board and we have tableaus and workshops where people come in and comment on the different pilots and we're trying to, you know, put all of our heads together and try to generate the best possible pilots out there. It's a really difficult work and so many moving pieces and different, you know, relationships that we need to manage. We've had some false starts already, but we've got a couple uh, on the way now uh, launching this summer, which is really great. We should have eight by the end of the year, uh, by the end of the project. Okay, so this is this marvelous project. I've given you the Facebook version of it, the rah-rah. I only showed you the good things, right? Uh, trying to put my, my best foot forward here, but it's uh, like, it is hard work to mobilize uh, a partnership like this. It is, I mean, uh, takes up all of our, you know, for three of us at least, it's a full, full-time job just to coordinate this project, right? And, uh, and I haven't shown you the things that we struggle with necessarily throughout it. And, and there are a lot of struggles, and I've had, and all of us have had quite a few sleepless nights in trying to put all of these pieces together. I don't, I don't, I'm, you know, I, I don't lose sleep over little things like a deadline being missed or, uh, you know, some money that we thought was there wasn't going to be, like, those are issues that are normal. I can work on those things during the nine to five, right? They don't worry me at night. The things that worry me at night are um, really about justice and equity and who we are, you know, and, and what we're, what we're, uh, trying to do and whether or not we'll achieve our grand goal of improving, you know, the equity situation in this country. So, I mean, my biggest worry is are we, are we really going to be able to move the needle and achieve some of these really lofty goals? And there's certain decisions that we've made along the way that have benefits and costs associated with them. One of the main decisions that we made is who were we going to do this project with? And we decided to work kind of within the establishment to do this project. To work with planners, to work with governments, to work with some companies. The very people who say are responsible for the marginalization of different population groups, right, in our planning structures. And we're here trying to work with them to make things better. So, you know, are we going to be able to achieve our goals by working with the establishment in an incremental way? Or would we have been better off doing something a bit more radical, more, even more community focused and organized from the grassroots up? And um, I think it's a great kind of thing to discuss during the panel, because lots of academics choose to go that route, right? And we have some constraints, but also some benefits by going with the establishment. So I do worry about that and think about, is it lip service? Or are we really going to get the change that we need? Um, I, I struggle a lot with this idea of imposing and setting standards, actually. Um, when we had our, some of our workshops and we invited American um, practitioners and, and academics, they actually told us that the Title VI legislation has been a bit of a setback in the US, that be, once you set a standard, uh, especially uh, uh, municipalities with that, that don't have a lot of resources, they, everyone kind of falls back to just this, bo this box checking exercise of we've met the standard, right? Like we conduct our spatial analysis and our project doesn't disproportionately impact low-income African-American neighborhoods, like box checked, and, and let's move on. But it doesn't really um, push those municipalities to try to be more progressive 
right, with their, with their work and their investments. And I do worry that we somehow get trapped in a situation where we can't uh, uh, convince decision makers to adopt standards that will perpetually keep moving the needle forward in a progressive way, to keep, uh, not just do no harm, but actually keep doing good. Let's keep making the system more just and more equitable. So what kind of standard do we need that can impose that? The standards that we heard from Angela yesterday about a 400 meter walk to a transit bus stop, it's a huge accomplishment to meet that standard. But you know, what about the standard of making sure that low income neighborhoods are actually connected efficiently to, uh, to meaningful destinations or that they can actually afford their transit? We, don't, we have some policies and activities in place but it's out of the goodness of their hearts and their, you know, and it's hard. Angela, I'm sure, works day and night trying to convince the TTC board that this stuff matters, right? But having a Canadian um, standard in place that's adopted by many different governments really uh, helps move that needle with decision makers. I hate to say it, but I think a lot of the change that we're gonna see is through a bit of a name and shame uh, approach rather than a let's rationally argue why equity matters, right? We're gonna have to show, well, this, this city's adopted this policy and what are you doing for your low income population? Nothing, right? And some of what we're gonna have to do is, is that. Um, anyway, so big concerns about are we gonna get that standard and will it be the type that really keeps uh, change occurring. Uh, another issue, and I've only got four, so we're almost done, is just, you know, we call our project Mobilizing Justice, but I think it's really fair that when we speak to some community experts, and they, they say justice for who, you know? Um, is this a, a project to make academics, you know, successful? and get nice publications and have a higher citation count and for the cities to say, oh look, we've responded to needs. You know, is it just a, an exercise of these kind of colonial institutions, right, to um, perpetuate uh, our own successes and, and, and productivity? Or, or is this really about justice for um, impacted communities? And when we look at those impacted communities, there's such a diversity of communities out there. Historically, I was mostly focused on low income and poverty, right? And when we started engaging with more communities, just this whole issue of, of racial discrimination, right, um, in transportation also, of course, has become very central to our, to our project, but a lot of the rationales, approaches, and histories are very diverse across different marginalized communities. And it's a bit of a juggling act, uh, trying to decide how to frame the project, how to support the need, uh, and also how to show different population groups that we're all in this together as well. And that, you know, there's some intersections there. And it's just been a big, big challenge looking at those different lenses of foci. Uh, huge worries about over-promising here and under -delivering. I think that I've already kind of said that. Um, one of the big issues is that we can do this research. Uh, we can even get the communities on board. Uh, we can certainly get practitioners on board, but politicians are gonna be politicians, and decision makers are gonna be decision makers, and elections are gonna be won over back of the napkin transportation planning uh, in, the, in this country you know, for decades to come. And, and we don't actually have a solution to that political economy question, right? Like, or that, that, that political science question. And um, the communities that we work with are very cognizant of that. And we have to be, you know, very careful about um, over-promising when we don't really have a solution to, you know, that higher level of decision-making that, that really, in large respects in this country, unfortunately, uh, dominates the, the infrastructure decision-making that we have. So with that, um, 
I'll, I'll end there and very much looking forward to the panelists and, and the discussion that follows.